It's five o'clock. चल yes good afternoon students have you all received uh, the notice for the assignment have you received the questions yes ma'am okay very good yes so go through the questions and keep your assignments ready you have to write it on you have, it it must be handwritten you have to scan it and you keep the pdf ready so when you have when you have the exam when you have the internal exam you have to attach it to the internal exam okay i think it's clear with everyone <clears throat> okay i am sharing the screen <clears throat> yes so we looked at uh, biodiversity and conservation if you remember from yesterday's lecture we looked at what are the threats to biodiversity so we studied monoculture in detail then we also studied coral bleaching we looked at what is uh what is coral bleaching what are the effects of it what are the causes of it we also studied very important other uh different reasons and the effects of uh, global warming on the on biodiversity um which was again a rising concern because you know that the temperature of the earth is rising and there is a great need for us to control these rising global temperatures um if <clears throat> there is also uh they uh, uh, we watched a very short documentary if you remember um by al gore and uh, where we saw how the temperature how the uh, north pole was when it was in the 1950s and then the condition of the north pole today so there were concrete proofs which were given um, which show the depth of the effect right so therefore uh, global warming is changing migration patterns also so if you remember 
we saw how the migration pattern of these uh, Siberian cranes, if it changes, what happens? Similarly, also even fishes, because there are fishes, uh, marine water fishes who migrate to the rivers to lay their eggs. And therefore, what will be the effect if there is a rise in the sea level? Okay, uh, so now today, let us look at some of the means of conservation. <clears throat> okay, so I have shared the slide. I hope every, uh, is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh -huh, yes, we also saw these different categories of uh, IUCN. Uh, so, endangered, critically endangered, vulnerable, least concern, and extinct. So, in total, there are nine categories. But uh, for our uh, case, we have to look at those five important ones. So, we should know which, so we should know at least two examples of each of the categories. <clears throat> then we are now looking at conservation strategies so you know that um, there is in c2 conservation and x c2 conservation i think we studied this yesterday the meaning of in c2 conservation and x c2 conservation now let us look at uh, the different strategies of in C2 conservation. <clears throat> uh, did we see this slide yesterday? Did we study the design of a national park? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, I think we saw the first three, right? So before we discuss the next three, uh, let's look at some of the in C2 measures of conservation. Uh, yes. Okay. So look at the slide, everyone. Now, in C2 conservation, it means conserve the animal wherever it is naturally found. So if it is found in the jungles, if it is found in any forest, then you declare that forest as a national park. Okay, so these in situ method of conservation is a method of conservation where the animal is not removed from its site, from its natural habitat. So the animal is conserved in its natural habitat. This is the meaning of in situ conservation. The means of doing that are about three, four. So the first one is a national park. So if you declare any region as a national park, or if you declare a jungle where you have, you, uh, you know, there are a lot of lions, like for example, in the Gir forest. So if you declare that forest as a protected network, as a national park, then that region is going to get conserved the animals are going to be able to freely roam around, okay? And we are not going to disturb the habitat of these animals. We are going to conserve them in their own natural habitat. I think yesterday students had a doubt about this. So I hope you are clear now, is that wherever the animal is found, even if it is found in a mountain, even if it is found in an in a ocean, or even if it is found in a jungle, Wherever it is found, you conserve the animal right there. So does that make sense? Are you following this? So you can, uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can write them or you can ask them anytime. Okay, so the first one is an national park. The second is a wildlife sanctuary. So now, what is the difference between a wildlife sanctuary and a national park? Okay, so let's study them. A national park, uh, from the name itself, it is national, which means that it is actually declared by the center. 
so you have forest officials uh, you have the indian forest service ifs the indian forest service officials are in charge of the management of these national parks they are declared by the central government uh the reason being that sometimes you know animals or jungles can spread across two states so therefore if it is managed by the center by the central government or then it becomes easier um so you know that animals they don't understand boundaries so uh, they can span over i mean there can be a national park or a jungle which is in madhya pradesh and rajasthan also or between rajasthan and up or between maharashtra and madhya pradesh right so what to do is that the, that region becomes a national park then the then what is the wildlife sanctuary <clears throat> they are declared by the state government so they are within the state boundaries they do not uh, their expanse is not such that they will spread across two states so they belong to one state so these are the, this is the case of wild life sanctuary they are also managed by the state uh, police uh, by the state wardens so the chief wardens or you know the forest officials which are recruited by the state they are in charge of these wildlife sanctuaries okay so this is the difference between a national park and a wildlife sanctuary now look at the third look at the third um, conservation strategy it is called as a biosphere reserve it is called as a biosphere reserve now biosphere reserves are nothing but they are national parks only but there are let's say 100 national parks in a country out of those only a few of them are recognized by unesco so i'm writing it in the chat box <clears throat> so the national parks of any country which are recognized by unesco which are recognized internationally they are called as biosphere reserves so therefore why again why does that happen because animals can also move across from one country to another right like for example i told you the case of tanzania and kenya so there is a i am writing it in the chat box <clears throat> so there is a serengeti national park in tanzania and there is masai mara reserve in kenya right so these are in two different countries but what happens every year there is migration between these two national parks basically they are neighbors they are neighbors just like uh, india and nepal so therefore these animals they move across the border and so that whole area has been declared as a biosphere reserve by unesco uh is that clear so there are examples of unesco biosphere reserves in india also even if they don't span across uh, so your nilgiris or your sundarbans they are biosphere reserves so biosphere reserves are international national parks are i mean biosphere reserves are recognized internationally national parks are <coughs> formed and maintained by the center and wildlife sanctuaries are formed and declared maintained by the state government is that clear so i uh, have you understood the difference between these three is it clear <clears throat> okay yes okay now look at the third one so there are these sacred groves and sacred lakes 
sacred grooves and sacred lakes so sacred grooves in in marathi or in maharashtra we call them devrai <coughs> you must have heard about it uh <coughs> they are called by different names in they are called by different na names in different states so in maharashtra we call them devrai but the english name is sacred grooves or there are also sacred great uh, lakes what happens is that you know sometimes there are villagers or there are tribal people for whom a certain amount of forest the trees the ecosystem it is very it is considered holy it is considered sacred so what they do is they don't they don't touch that forest for them it is very sacred so they will not pluck the fruits also they will not touch the leaves so therefore what happens it becomes free from any human interference and so it naturally gets conserved right so animals there are able to roam around freely the trees have a lot of biodiversity they are not chopped down there is no deforestation yeah so therefore sacred grooves and sacred lakes which are recognized by uh the different states different people in different states of india they indirectly help in biodiversity conservation so they were formed with that thought only of conserving but in modern terms like in modern language we say that they also contribute to biodiversity conservation does that make sense same is the case of your sacred lakes right if you don't pollute that lake you know they don't even go and they don't even go and do fishing right they therefore the lake remains pristine the lake remains untouched and therefore uh, the whole pond ecosystem gets recharged every time and it is free from any human interference here and therefore it shows great amount of biodiversity of marine ecosystems or aquatic ecosystems <clears throat> so therefore on a local level so this was international national state and this is on a local level so on a local level they are contributing to biodiversity conservation is that clear the case of uh, biosphere reserves again is that they can be of two types even national parks can be of two types they can be terrestrial or they can be marine so for example when we saw olive ridley turtles uh, you remember the names of the national parks <clears throat> the national parks which were formed to conserve these uh marine ecosystems so they are bhitar kanika and gahir matha of course there are even a mount harris national park in andaman and nicobar which is again a marine ecosystem yeah and of course there are a number of terrestrial ecosystems so therefore it is very very essential that we understand and practice different types of conservation strategies either we do it at a local level or we can also do it at an international level the case of because biodiversity comes in different levels like we saw genetic species and ecosystems so therefore <coughs> it is very essential that we set aside a particular untouched area of nature in the form of national parks or wildlife sanctuaries right so what they do is they will preserve the diversity of life in that region is that clear now um there are um okay let's see the slide so we will understand it better okay so this is uh, some of the statistics that tells you 
how many national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, etc., are present in the country. So we have around 100 national parks. We have wildlife sanctuaries in different states. And then you have conservation reserves and community reserves. So both these, number three and number four, they can be private. So internationally, a lot of these community reserves are there because internationally, um, conservation takes place privately also. But in India, most of the conservation is by the government. Then you have tiger reserves, elephant reserves, and of course you have biosphere reserves. In the case of these uh, species, right? The case of these uh, different number of species, uh, they is that you know you cannot protect species individually because they are all in, uh, dependent on each other. So what happens? The entire ecosystem needs to be protected. Right, like you cannot say that, okay, I will just protect this particular species of plant or I will just protect the tigers. I will not protect anything else, right? That is not possible because, you know, tigers need deer for their prey. Deer need grass, right? So there should be good amount of forest cover also. There should be good amount of grasslands. So because species are interdependent on each other, the whole ecosystem must be protected. If you want to protect the tiger, you must protect the grass also. So I, are you understanding this? Does it make sense? <clears throat> yes. So therefore, uh, these national parks or these reserves, they have added significance because of the diversity in them, right? Also, sometimes uh, these uh, national parks or wildlife sanctuaries, they differ from each other uh, because of the animals that are found there. Now, some animals they require, like, like for example, look at elephants. I mean, they require different types of habitat uh, to feed in different types of seasons. Um, you know, what happens is because, you know, they, elephants, they feed on young, <clears throat> young grass, young grass shoots, you know, because young grass is more nutritious. So therefore, uh, just after monsoon season or just after the rains, the elephants, uh, enjoy that time, right? Because the grass is nice and fresh, the grass is young, the grass is nutritious. And so after the rains, they utilize these open grasslets. <coughs> right? So that is in the monsoon season. And then what happens when the winter sets in? What happens to these elephants? Is that they move into the deeper forest to feed on the foliages from the trees, right? So therefore, what happens is the national park, it, it is meant to protect elephants in such a way that it should be large enough to protect even the habitat, right? So because of the interlinkages of the ecosystem, because of the interlinkage of species with each other, you cannot just target elephants. You have to target the entire ecosystem. Is that clear? If you want to protect the tiger, you must protect the grass also. And so therefore, uh, in, in, um, in India, it is again very, very vital that we look at some of these animals uh, which are now critically endangered. Right. So, for example, um, you must have heard about tiger senses. Okay, let me just write it in the chat box. Okay. So, a recent tiger census was held in 2019. And 
the good news is that the tiger population has increased okay so how after how many years is the human population conducted the human census conducted in india mhanje apli janaganana kadhi hote kiti varshanni hote yes correct so now it is it will happen right in in the coming year i think did it i think it got postponed because of the pandemic but ho hopefully in the next year it it will happen right but the case of tigers is that it takes place every 4 years 4 to 5 years uh, so the recent census was done in 2019 and the and the tiger population has increased okay so how do you think uh, tigers are counted so if i want to do um <clears throat> a tiger census if i want to know the details of the tiger population how should i count them or what do you think how are they counted you can uh, speak on the mic or you can write it down yes how do you think tigers are counted Yes, anyone? Yes, Jahanavi, Prathamesh, Girish. Where are these students, ma'am? Yes, Jahanavi. Ma'am, uh, jungle. I mean, the Kaiti Kani the camera la hota. Ah, jito jito mostly ah uh, vagza to. Ashati Kani camera pan set up ke lele asta. Tani ah uh, tancha gada ma deti ji color kadi kadi ghat lele asti. ट्रैकिंग चीप साधारण लक्षा कुछ जाते जित मोस्टली तथा कैमेरा मध्य मुंट रेकॉर्ड साधारण अंदाज लेरी करेक्ट एनीथिंग एनी वन एल्स एनी वन एल्स नो एनी अदर मेथड वेर इज अभिषेक गिरीश नवनाथ वैभव वैभव वॉट अबाउट सिद्धी शी वॉज एक्ट शी वॉज युअर येस्टरडे राईट सिद्धी सौरभ ऐश्वर्या येस ओके सो ओके नॉट अ लॉट ऑफ देम नो अबाउट इट ओके फाईन सो लेट्स okay so someone mentioned pug marks okay so there is a just a a good talk a small video about the science of counting tigers right so because um we need to know how to classify each animal into these different categories of endangered critically endangered we need to know the we need to know a head count right if i have facts in my hand right that okay we have 4000 tigers okay we have now 5000 tigers then these concrete facts will help me to upgrade my conservation strategies yeah so therefore uh, it's very very vital that i know the i know a specific count okay so how does india do its tiger census uh, we will just quickly see that and then we will discuss it uh so this is a a, a very short video by uh, conservation india and there is a, a very famous biologist i mean he's a he's a wildlife biologist dr karanth and uh, so he will tell us why it is important to count tigers right and how it is actually done uh, so let's quickly study that and uh, does anyone have a question okay is it visible to you yes ma'am is audible Yes, ma'am. 
okay so you can see conservation india right <clears throat> major massive problems the assumption was that you could send guards out across the country and get it to the individual tiger and that's not possible the second is the assumption that you could get the one particular pug mark usually a hind pug mark of each tiger and then the third assumption is regardless of soil conditions or slope or uh, the speed at which the animal was moving you get very accurate tracings and you can compare two tracings and um, individuals can be identified now these tracings are obtained by clicking a piece of glass and tracing the track or from a plaster cast and there is no way you can completely with certainty identify individuals unless the animal has a real deformity in its tracks or something so it has this whole set of flaws leading to basically a complete mess in the end often think that it's enough if you protect the forest and leave tigers alone you don't have to count them i completely disagree because tigers are under tremendous pressure humans are putting huge impacts on them including massive hunting and other things and we are trying all sorts of things to stop these impacts so uh, just by spending money or doing things we may not be recovering tigers we will know for sure only if we actually on tigers that's the currency of success or failure in tiger conservation uh, the best method to count tiger populations in a particular reserve is a method called camera trapping uh, you identify trails and areas where tigers move and you put automatic cameras two in a place so when a tiger moves through it triggers the cameras and the, both the cameras take pictures of two sides of the animal once you have two sides uh, the pictures of stripes on both sides you can compare each tiger to another one and definitely identify them as individuals give them even numbers like stripes are unique each animal uh, like fingerprints on human beings are and identifying them is not rocket science even a 10 year old child can do it by comparing stripes but the stripes differ on two sides of the body so to definitely identify an individual you need both pictures and very interestingly even if you photograph a 3 month old cub and as the animal grows and becomes an adult you can still identify the stripes absolutely no problem uh and the particularly when you cannot deploy cameras where cameras are likely to get stolen or tigers are at very low densities where we are unlikely to um, encounter them using cameras uh, there is a new method that has been developed and this involves the use of dna uh, tigers as they move in the forest they deposit their scats or droppings to mark their territories or to send signals to others uh, by collecting fresh scats uh you can extract dna from the scat dna of the tiger from the scat and then you can do dna fingerprinting and identify individual tigers from that and the, the that data also can be analyzed very similarly to camera trap data only thing is you won't have nice pictures of tigers you just have a spook uh, camera trapping actually allows you over time to make database of all individual tigers that are in an area for example having worked in karnataka for nearly 20 years with camera trapping i have a database of more than 50 tigers that we have trapped in this area over time of course some die new animals come in this is a complete picture of many are being born how many new animals are coming how are they surviving and this is vital information because they are under a lot of pressure the other benefit is that often times when a crime is committed a skin is seized you are able to match the pattern to living tigers and clearly point that this tiger came from this population so the criminal cannot claim it is an something that he inherited from his father or whatever so it it has some forensic uses also uh,
yes so is it clear how they how it is done um so the uh, i think students have mentioned pug marks right so pug marks which means uh, footprints so what happens they are not reliable there can be repetition when pug marks are counted also it's very difficult also it's very time consuming so therefore pug marks are not used in recent times what is used is like they mentioned camera trapping method so in camera trapping they showed you that they take photographs of the animal from both the sides and then they match it with both the sides like they match it with the animal um very important also is uh, recently they do it with a software i, I think it's called m stripes so you just put it in the soft in a software and it and, and it analyzes everything for you um very modern technology today which was used in the 2019 census is you use satellite imagery so there is a lot of uh, remote sensing and uh, a lot of geo tagging which is done today so therefore uh, because you know we have isro has done milestones in research and so we use that satellite technology also for uh, keeping a count of these wildlife the advantage of using you know geo satellites is that you can gather information about the entire national park right you can track the movement of these animals and very important you can also track their seasonal changes right because from summer their behavior is different in the winters and in the monsoon their behavior changes so all of that can be easily tracked and all of that data can be maintained because of you know remote sensing so um technological advancement is also helping uh conservation strategies so are you understanding this <clears throat> yes correct yes ma'am yes uh the so this is how um, all of these animals are counted yes correct uh so why is it important i think he he mentioned this point but let me ask you why is it important that we keep uh photographs the camera trapping method where he showed you that they have a database of all the animals uh since they were born right so um why is it important to keep this database of these animals Do do you have any guesses to recognize them okay. uh, by observing their stripes, the pattern of their stripes? Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> yes. So, also, what is done? You know, when we discussed poaching, right? Illegal hunting. um so if uh, there is cross country movement or if there is illegal hunting um right so if someone just says that okay this tiger has come from another national park right so then they can say no no it is not we have a data right so therefore this illegal trade of animals and also illegal hunting of animals uh, can be cross checked because we already have a database right we can i mean they can come and tell they can come and give you proof that the animal has been residing in this national park since birth so that is the advantage of i mean one of the advantages of uh, keeping data right and uh, thanks to these uh, wildlife biologists uh, we have our animals in india today they are safe right so 
um, we have successful conservation strategies. <clears throat> okay. The other way. Yes. Uh, look at the statistics. Yes, let me saw this. Yes. So. Okay. So this is uh, about a national park. So we will see these two slides, the difference between uh, a national park and a wildlife sanctuary. Yes, so someone read this slide. Yes, where are students? Is Jahanavi here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, can you read this slide? Yes. A national park is an area where the natural or historical objects of national significance are protected along with the wildlife therein in such a manner and by such means as, as will leave them unimpaired, unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. Such protected areas are created by central legislation and enjoy highest level of legal protection. They usually form the focal area of the project tiger reserves. The human activity is confined to management duties and control tourism, strictly enforced by the law. Yes, correct. Very good. So they are created by the center and they enjoy legal protection. So that brings me to this slide, which we studied yesterday. I think we studied only half of it. Um, now look at this diagram. Look at this diagram. Every national park, every national park, it has a it has these three areas okay so look at these areas they are important the core area it has a core area you can see here in dark brown then it has a buffer area i'll just zoom it and then it has a transition zone right so every uh, national park has these three areas the importance of this, the importance of this is that inside the core area, it is where these animals live and reproduce. There's a lot of breeding. The core area should be untouched by human interference of any national park. Okay. And then there is the core area is enveloped in a buffer area which is a buffer area for the core area. So sometimes, you know, if the animals uh, expand their habitat, then again, they are safe. It's not like they will move out of the transition zone and enter into the urban spaces. Therefore, that is the purpose of the buffer area. Then the outermost area is called as a transition zone where, wherein, you know, tourism activities are allowed so your wildlife safaris, uh, other photography, tourism. Also, you know, there can be village settlements, uh, some amount of farming. So all that is permitted within the transition zone. But that is not allowed inside the core area. And every national park has a core area, a buffer area, and transition zone. Is that clear? Now, the question is, should the design of a national park, should it be circular or should it be linear? What do you think? <clears throat> what, how should be the shape of a national park? Should it be circular or as you can see here, uh, should it be linear? Yes, you can speak on the phone or you can write it. Yes, so what are students saying in the chat box? Okay, some are saying linear. Shiva is saying circular. Ariman depends on the topography. Okay, but Ariman, I'm giving you two choices between linear and circular, what should it be?
okay some more students are saying circular yes so why do you think it should be that why do you think it should be linear or why do you think it should be circular what is your reasoning behind it any 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 more students <clears throat> yes okay yes so now look at it it should be circular why now look at this design a linear design what happens in the linear design the distance from the core to the outside of the national park is very less yes is someone speaking okay so look at the slide the distance between the core and the outside area that is the outside of the national park it is very less whereas in a circular it is nice it is long it is buffered so in a circular design there is minimum exposure to the outside which is going to be your towns villages you know an urban space or it can be an industry yes so does that make sense are you following this in a circular a national park it is nice it is well protected it is buffered the core area is well inside whereas in a linear design it is more exposed uh yes what are you saying <coughs> excuse me yes so okay you are understanding this okay so students are agreeing with this is that it should be circular very good and then a last question should it be should now i think we discussed fragments right now let's say there was no option and the national park got fragmented so should these fragments should they have corridors between them or should they be separate so you can see it on the slide corridors a corridor manje kya hai ki it is connected it is connected with each other or should they be separate how do you think should be the design of a national park or what do you think are the advantages of having corridors corridor mujhe kya hai ki it is connected okay yes uh corridors okay so aryaman have you been to this national park so what do you mean by connected it has connected corridors as in the design are you saying the design okay so yes that is correct shruti is also correct okay is the it should have corridors you know what happens is that if it is just separate or it is fragmented the animals are unable to move safely from one part of the eco national park to the other park if they have corridors which means they are they are junctions right so therefore the animals can move freely from one part to another it having corridors means that it is nothing but a whole national park which means that corridors actually turn fragments into a whole ecosystem so therefore even if you are fragmenting a national park if you have no other option but to fragment them then you should at least provide corridors which means that you should provide junctions for the animals to move around in the corridors it should be ensured that there is no human interference so that the animals are able to pass freely from one part of the national park to the other because 
the problem with these separate or spaced out fragments is that they create uh, isolated populations of animals they also create uh, scattered and small populations of animals and once that happens if they are separated if there is a very small population of wildlife it leads to inbreeding right so i think we saw this yesterday that inbreeding is again harmful because it does not encourage genetic diversity so the gene pool or the diversity of dna gets reduced because of inbreeding yes so the ideal national park must be large it should be whole if there is no option if there is fragmentation the fragments must not be spaced out they should be clustered and wherever possible there should be corridors between them so that they are well connected i think many uh, places in india they have fragmented national parks because of either a railway line or a road but they also have corridors which means that there are some areas in the forest which are free from any uh, urbanization or any railway line or any road and so therefore these animals can be safely grown in their own habitat so does that does this make sense with everyone are you following this yes ma'am yes so therefore these national parks you know are uh, protected areas right they, they they have the protection of the center and the state the the national park or a wildlife sanctuary is legally protected okay it is protected by law so there is a wildlife conservation act so if you go and do illegal hunting or if you do you know illegal trade of wildlife parts then it is sub, you are, you will be subject to law okay so the buffer zone the core zone it is all defined under these wildlife protection act so therefore um uh, not only in c2 conservation but also there is a lot of legal protection of uh, when it comes to these national parks so are you uh, clear with this okay so tomorrow i mean okay next class yes so next class we will continue with this topic and uh, we will meet at uh next class is on wednesday right uh it is what is the date Okay, it's twenty ninth. Okay, so even if it is New Year's, it's approaching New Year's next week. We have class. Okay, so on twenty ninth, we are going to meet at five o'clock. Yes, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask. Are you clear with the difference between in C two and X C two? the difference between uh, national parks wildlife sanctuaries biosphere reserves uh yes i will give you the attendance form the attendance link uh it's the same as yesterday have you saved it okay let me put it no, in ma'am. the chat box yes i will share it in the chat box <clears throat> uh yes if you have the link you can start filling the attendance <clears throat> so the link is going to be active for only 5 minutes
Yes. So the link is also in the chat box. You can find it there. The link is uh, in the chat box. It is only active for five minutes. Uh, there is a question. Yes, correct. So your um, national parks, uh, so I mean your Devrais, right? So which is your sacred groups, they are a type of uh, community reserve. Because, you know, a group of tribal people or a group of villagers, uh, they come together and they respect that region as a community, right? So they are an example of community reserves only. Yes, and they are also uh, privately recognized. So because, uh, because the government knows that no harm will be done and that they are, you know, they are considered, they are worshipped, they are considered as a holy. So therefore they can be in a national park or they can be outside also of a national park. And it is actually beneficial that they are outside the national park because then they will have extra protection. They will have added protection. So does that answer your question? <clears throat> yes, it's, so it's like a community reserve itself. Yes, like I told you, the case of national parks, it, yes, uh, I'm answering that question, is that see, the case of national parks is such that, you know, you cannot protect uh, individual species. You have to protect the entire ecosystem. Right? So even if there is uh, a few critically endangered species which are living in that national park, you cannot just protect them. You have to protect the entire ecosystem. So that is why, I mean, that is why these national parks have an added importance, right? Because they have great biodiversity. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So those who, if you don't have any questions, yes, you can leave. Those who have given the attendance, you can leave. Thank you, ma'am. And we will meet Thank you, uh, next week. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma yes, the link is in the chat box. Yes, the assignment is of five marks. Correct. The assignment is of five marks. And uh, there are three questions. You solve any two of those given three. Solve any two of the given three questions. So it is for 2.5 marks. So total five marks. Yes, that is correct. Yes, you cannot, sub, uh, yeah, no, no. So you won't be able to submit the form without writing the assignment. So you have to attach the PDF, only then the test can be submitted. Okay, any more questions? It's six o'clock. All right, so we will uh, stop and we will meet tomorrow. Uh, sorry, we will meet next week on Wednesday at five o'clock.